welcome to Dissecting Philosophy with Dr. MacDonald. In this episode, we're going to be dealing with the sections Flies of the Marketplace and of Chastity in Nietzsche's Zarathustra. We also have the film examples of The Truman Show to accompany the section The Flies of the Marketplace and a discussion of the film Cruel Intentions to accompany the section on Chastity. So let's get cracking on of the flies of the marketplace. Flee, my friend, into your solitude. I see you deafened by the uproar of the great men and pricked by the stings of the small ones. Forest and rock know well how to be silent with you. Be like the tree again, the wide branching tree that you love. Calmly and attentively it leans out over the sea. Where solitude ceases, there the marketplace begins. And where the marketplace begins, there begins the uproar of the great actors and the buzzing of the poisonous flies. In the world, even the best things are worthless apart from him who first presents them. People call these presenters great men. The people have little idea of greatness, that is to say, creativeness but they have a taste for all presenters and actors of great things. The world revolves about the inventor of new values. Imperceptibly, it revolves. But the people and the glory revolve around the actor. That is the way of the world. The actor possesses spirit, but little conscience of the spirit. He always believes in that with which he most powerfully produces belief produces belief in himself. Tomorrow you will have a new faith, and the day after tomorrow a newer one. He has a quick perception, as the people have, and a capricious temperament. To overthrow to him, that means to prove. To drive frantic to him, that means to convince. And blood is to him the best of all arguments. A truth that penetrates only sensitive ears he calls a lie, and a thing of nothing. Truly he believes only in gods who make a great noise in the world. So this section immediately starts off with the words flee. Basically run, run straight away into your solitude, away from the marketplace, away from the herd. Why is that the case? Because the herd worships those who are actors and those who basically present truth and present values to us that are meant to be good and they themselves don't even know what exactly they're talking about in any given sense of it. And of course a parallel can be made in contemporary society with Donald Trump when Trump precisely says a lot of hot air basically, to make himself look really good. But when it comes down to the whole factual basis, of course, it's completely inaccurate and completely false. But what's interesting from what Nietzsche wants to say is, well, this is precisely what everyday people love, is all the noise that you can basically muster up and how good you can make a speech look, even if you have absolutely no factual basis or any sort of credible thing that you're saying whatsoever. It doesn't matter. People love the performance. People love the theater and drama about everything. And a parallel here can be made into Plato's dialogue called Gorgias, where Gorgias is a great rhetorician. So again, that sense of a great person who gives speeches. And what Plato does as well, through the dialogue, slowly picks apart what Gorgias says. And of course, it goes into the really quite funny and absurd lens of what Gorgias is trying to say. And an example is when they go to the doctor and, you know, who are you going to listen to? Is it going to be the physician? Is it going to be the doctor? Are you going to listen to Gorgias? And any sane person would say, you're going to listen to the physician, not Gorgias. But Gorgias goes, ah, but I can convince the person and so forth. But then Plato goes, well, is that actually going to help them though? What do you know? And 
Gorgias, of course, had absolutely no medical training whatsoever. Same thing when Gorgias goes down, I think it's in the sort of wall of the whatever city that they're in, and he goes, how are you going to help people there? Ah, oh, well, I can talk really well and so forth. Yeah, but do you have actually the building knowledge? No, you don't. So, therefore, you're just a complete poser. Therefore, you're just acting like you know. And you have absolutely no basis for what you're saying whatsoever. And it's the same there that what Nietzsche is saying as well, is that when you bring up the problems, what is the things that is so easy to overthrow all these people who talk about hot air basically and act like they know to prove to convince and therefore to just show the fact you have actually a form of credibility factual basis some actual grounding to your whole argument will immediately show flaws in some person who's just basically all hot air and pure performance if you come in with a well-rounded well argued for point that can be backed up that's going to be much better than simply just acting like you know and putting on a massive performance so continuing on then the marketplace is full of solemn buffoons and the people boast of their great men these are their heroes of the hour but the hour presses them so they press you, and from you too they require yes or no, and woe to you if you want to set your chair between for and against. Do not be jealous, lover of truth, because of these inflexible and oppressive men. Truth has never yet clung to the arm of an inflexible man. Return to your security because of these abrupt men. Only in the marketplace is one assailed with yes or no. The experience of all deep wells is slow. They must wait long until they know what has fallen into their depths. All great things occur away from glory and the marketplace. The inventors of new values have always lived away from glory and the marketplace. Flee, my friend, into your solitude. I see you stung by poisonous flies. Flee to where the raw, rough breeze blows. Flee into your solitude. You have lived too near the small and the pitiable men. Flee from their hidden vengeance. Towards you they are nothing but vengeance. No longer lift your arm against them. They are innumerable, and it is not your fate to be a fly swat. Innumerable are these small and pitiable men, and raindrops in weeds have already brought about the destruction of many a proud building. You are no stone, but already these many drops have made you hollow. You will yet break and burst apart through these many drops. I see you wearied by poisonous flies. I see you bloodily torn in a hundred pieces, and your pride refuses even to be angry. They want blood from you in all innocence. They are bloodless souls thirst for blood and therefore they sting in all innocence but you profound man you suffer too profoundly even from small wounds and before you have recovered the same poison worm is again crawling over your hand you are too proud to kill these sweet-toothed creatures in this little next section then we have sort of a breakdown of what makes up a problem with the herd mentality of things and that's breaking everything down into either requiring a yes or a no and then we can think about well what exactly can be missing here the question why or how so the questions of yes or no is that do you agree or do you not do you think this is correct or not and it's that you either are on board with what someone says or are completely against what someone says and just that complete juxtaposition between sides of things and Nietzsche's highlighting here the problems with just simply taking a yes or no answer is that we forget about questioning whether the actual thing itself is a question or way of thinking is correct 
you must wait long until you know what has fallen into your, their depths. So ultimately that waiting out, uncovering and unearthing the problems that's there, rather than just simply either agreeing or disagreeing with it, is a much slower and longer process, asking the questions why, get into a deeper critical understanding of something rather than just simply agreeing or disagreeing. And also in relation to herd mentality, we have people in the general populace ultimately being like flies, constantly buzzing around people and stinging them. And really like mosquitoes here in the sense of they want blood from you and so constantly want to suck away at your life and your life force ultimately and what you are not wanting to be is just turning to be a complete fly swat trying to just swat all these horrible flies and mosquitoes and so forth away from you all the time and if you stick around in this state of the marketplace and stick around with the common people ultimately you're going to be hollowed out with them because you're going to be made into this completely passive submissive person who agrees with whatever is said or disagrees with it in a very juxtaposition sort of way you're not going to think critically about things and the more and more you go on you're just hollowed out in an almost easter egg style of a human being it could just be eventually cracked and there's nothing there of you left as an individual anymore and that's not what we want of course for Nietzsche what we want is for all that lovely hollowness to be filled in with what makes you up as an individual what exactly makes you up your own thoughts and your own perspective about things but he says well we have to flee from all this marketplace we have to free from this herd mentality in order so we're not these hollow men ultimately or hollow people continuing on but take care that it does not become your fate to bear all their poisonous injustice they buzz around you even with their praise and their praise is importunity they want to be near your skin and your blood they flatter you as if you were a god or a devil they whine before you as before a god or a devil what of it they are flatterers and whiners nothing more and they are often kind to you but that has always been the prudence of the cowardly yes the cowardly are prudent they think about you a great deal with their narrow souls you are always suspicious to them everything that is thought about a great deal is finally thought suspicious they punish you for all your virtues fundamentally they forgive you only your mistakes because you are gentle and just-minded you say they are not to be blamed for their little existence but their little souls think all great existence is blameworthy even when you are gentle towards them they still feel you despise them and they return your kindness with secret unkindness your silent pride always offends their taste they rejoice if you are ever modest enough to be vain when we recognize a peculiarity in a man we also inflame that peculiarity so guard yourself against the small men before you they feel themselves small and their baseness glimmers and glows against you in hidden vengeance have you not noticed how often they became silent when you approached them and how their strength left them like smoke from a dying fire yes my friend you are a bad conscience to your neighbors for they are unworthy of you thus they hate you and would dearly like to suck your blood your neighbors will always be poisonous flies that about you which is great that itself must make them more poisonous and ever more fly-like flee my friend into your solitude and to where the raw rough breeze blows it is not your fate to be a fly swat thus spoke zarathustra so we also have then a very machiavellian style in which people are enamored with those who espout their own values and opinions and almost become celebrity like as well and so machiavellian is ultimately putting on a front and being devious 
whilst your true intentions are completely hidden. So, for instance, you would be acting completely happy and nice and kind towards someone, even though that you completely, absolutely hated them, would be Machiavellian, because your true intentions and the true ways you thought about someone is completely hidden, and you're putting on this false front. Same thing here in the way in which we have this admiration for those who have their own values, are creative individuals, and everybody sort of lurks around them like bloodsuckers and leeches or mosquitoes is sort of the idea we have, and just want to suck the creative energy out of them. And what ultimately must they do is get away from all that again. We must ultimately just flee into solitude in order to be a creative individual. Why is that the case? Because if you stay within the marketplace or stay within the idea of a general society, what ultimately will happen is you just become a fly swatter in the sense of just continually trying to get rid of all these people that are just hangers on and just people who are just surrounding you and just kissing your butt and just being completely false in the way that they're also worshipping and adoring you and so on. And I think a really good movie here that illustrates this action is The Truman Show from 1998 starring Jim Carrey. So let's read a little bit of the plot. So Truman Burbank is the unsuspecting star of The Truman Show, a reality television program broadcast live around the clock worldwide. He spent his entire life in the seaside town of Sea Haven Island, which in reality was a giant set near Hollywood, equipped with state-of-the-art technology to simulate day-night weather conditions and thousands of cameras to watch him. The producers discouraged Truman from leaving Sea Haven by instilling him with aquaphobia through the death, in inverted commas, of his TV father in a boating accident and constantly broadcasting and printing messages of the dangers of travelling. All of Sea Haven's other residents are actors. Kristoff, the show's creator and executive producer, seeks to capture Truman's real emotion and human behaviour and give audiences a relatable everyday man. So, we get this sense in Truman's show as well of Jim Carrey reacting to, of course, the whole goings on within his life and everything within his life being completely a construct set up all for somebody else's entertainment and it touches upon that deeper point as well of well how do we know somebody else's true intentions how do we know who we're talking to and our friendships and relationships that we're going on how do we know there's not that machiavellian element at play that's there on the one hand they'll look great give us everything that we want to hear but on the other they're hiding actually their true thoughts and intentions for things and so we go through life and this sort of ideal construct that's set up for us and everything's all lovely jubbly and only when of course then things start to fall apart or the problems start to emerge does that then bubble start to burst or in the sense of what Nietzsche is saying as well does the hollow man start to crumble away and we get that in the Truman show when he does something unexpectedly so let's continue on reading the plot as well so despite Kristoff's control he couldn't predict all of Truman's actions During his college years, Truman was intended to fall in love and marry co-student Merrill, but fell for Sylvia, an extra. Sylvia warned him that his reality is fake before having to move to Fiji with her father. Whilst Truman went on to marry Merrill, he continues to think about Sylvia. He uses scraps from magazines to recreate her face in secret and travels to Fiji. Outside the show, Sylvia has become part of a free Truman campaign that demands the end of the show and Truman's freedom. As the show goes on, Truman starts noticing unusual events, a spotlight falling out of the sky, a radio frequency that precisely describes his movements, and rain that falls only on him. Truman spots a disheveled man and reorganizes him as his father, 
who had snuck back into the set, but other actors quickly dragged the man away. Despite efforts by Merle and Truman's best friend Marlon to reassure him, Truman becomes even more suspicious about his life. One evening, the production staff discovers that the sleeping Truman is completely out of their sight. Marlon, who is reintroduced as his father, is sent to check on Truman, finding out that he's left a dummy in a tape recorder playing snoring sounds in his place and disappeared through a makeshift tunnel. Marlon breaks his character and Kristoff orders the first transmission cut in the show's history whilst the citywide search for Truman is launched. Audiences around the world are drawn to the sudden change and Truman is found sailing out of Sea Haven. Having conquered his fear of water and Kristoff resumes the broadcast as he sends a man-made lightning storm to try to capsize the boat. Network executives fear that Truman may die on live television, but Truman manages to persist. Realizing that he cannot dissuade Truman any further, Kristoff ends the storm. Truman continues to set sail until, to his surprise, his boat strikes the wall of the dome, and he finds an exit door. But Kristoff, speaking directly to Truman through a speaker system, tries to convince him to stay, saying there is no more truth in the real world than staying in the artificial world he would have nothing to fear. But then Truman considers this and states his catchphrase, takes a bow and leaves. The viewers cheer Truman on while Sylvia races to greet him, and Christoph's superiors end the show for the last time, and the viewers see what else is on TV. So it's a fantastic movie as well that fits into that point that Nietzsche wants to say, that in order for us to have our own semblance of our own opinion, understanding the world and so forth, what we're presented with in society and the norms and our relationships with other people is all in this sort of Truman Show-like existence where it's this artifice that's there. And if you become a creative individual and if you have all this lovely creativity and develop your own things. People will just want to suck all that away from you and therefore just become like massive mosquitoes and bloodsuckers till it's all drained out of you and there's nothing left. What you need to do is ultimately get out of this artifice, get away from the people that's going to suck all the energy out of you, get away from all the, get away from all the bad influences as well for developing your thought and go into your own sort of space free from all this and how is that represented in the movie as well as that courageous moment where he decides to leave this artifice and the whole world that's being constructed for him and then presented with the problem that what you have in the real world is no more different than what's being created for you and him wanting to take that leap and to want to discover for himself what things are like. And it's that point is in order to be creative, in order for us to develop our own ideas and thoughts, we have to take a leap. We have to take that leap away from the artifice, norms, safety nets that's always been there for us and go basically into the venture of the unknown in a way, into our own voyage and own discovery and wanting to be in that Truman-like situation of having to hit that artifice and then go through it. So for this section, a problem really emerged to me for Nietzsche's description of the creative individual and how to be creative, is that we have, at the end of this section, really this complete, almost hermit-like existence where you're completely separated off from the general populace, almost living in your own little bubble that you've created up for yourself. And so in that little state, you're free from all the problems of everyday life and so on. But when you think about it in a deep sense, it's like, well, is that for everybody? No. Why is that the case? Normal people have all the problems of everyday life to think about. So can an everyday person be that creative, reclusive person? Now, who are the people that can have that opportunity to be reclusive in the first place? Well, surely it has to be people who are wealthy 
Why is that the case? Because wealthy people can have financial independence and therefore have a sense of creative freedom and therefore they don't have to worry about the everyday things of how am I going to put food on the table? How am I going to pay from these bills? How am I going to put clothes on the kids back and so forth? And so we end up with quite a really narrow sense here of what Nietzsche is saying of well in order to be creative really it has to be somebody who has the financial independence and opportunity to just basically live in that independent way in the first place and it's almost playing off Nietzsche's own life here as his own model for saying how one should live which is to say how did Nietzsche live moving independently around from southern France into Switzerland into northern Italy and so forth all quite independently and really is that practical for everybody no it's not and so my point would be it's quite a good thing actually to be the fly swatter in the first place because then we would have an engagement and conflict with our thoughts and so we're not completely left alone to our own devices and in having that engagement and having that conflict, isn't that something that's beneficial for our thoughts in order to have our own development of our own thoughts and engagement with somebody else who we disagree with rather than just go into this complete reclusive state altogether away from everybody. We can just think in quite a harmful way there that we're completely right and how we think oh if a group of other people completely disagree with me I'm not even going to engage them I'm just going to go and argue from my point over here in my own reclusive state and pure creativity and so you have this sort of view in which you just end up with your own confirmation of your own biases and completely you can have an eccentric lifestyle as you like that's fair enough but what does other people allow for us to do have that conflict conflict is something that's beneficial for us being that fly swatter even though it's annoying <laughs> that thing that's annoying in itself is a good thing because it's always keeping us in check always providing an alternative viewpoint for us rather than just for us to live in a complete solitary state away from all that in the first place so ultimately my point would be to be the fly swatter actually would allow for more creativity through that conflict through other perspectives and different opinions rather than to have it completely in that state of solitude that Nietzsche argues for there. Of chastity, I love the forest. It is bad to live in towns. Too many of the lustful live there. Is it not better to fall into the hands of a murderer than into the dreams of a lustful woman? And just look at these men. Their eye reveals it. They know of nothing better on earth than to lie with a woman. There is filth at the bottom of their souls, and it is worse if this filth still has something of the spirit in it. If only you had become perfect, at least as animals, but to animals belongs innocence. Do I exhort you to kill your senses? Do I exhort you to an innocence of the senses? Do I exhort you to chastity? With some, chastity is a virtue but with many is almost a vice. These people abstain, it is true, but the bitch sensuality glares enviously out of all they do. This restless beast follows them deep into the heights of their virtue and the depths of their cold spirit. And how nicely the bitch sensuality knows how to beg for a piece of spirit when a piece of flesh is denied her. Do you love tragedies and all that is heartbreaking? But I mistrust your bitch sensuality. Your eyes are too cruel for me. You look upon sufferers lustfully. Has your lovaciousness not merely disguised itself and called itself pity? And I offer you this parable. Not a few who sought to drive out their devil entered into the swine themselves. Those to whom chastity is difficult should be dissuaded from it. Least it become the way to hell, that is to filth and the lust, and lust of the soul. Am I speaking of dirty things? That does not seem to me the worst I could do. Not when truth is dirty, 
but when it is shallow, does the enlightened man dislike to wade in its waters? Truly, there are those who are chaste from the very heart. They are more gentle of heart, and they laugh more often, and more heartily than you. They laugh at chastity too, and ask, what is chastity? Is chastity not folly? But this folly came to us, and not we to it. We offered this guest love and shelter. Now it lives with us. Let it stay as long as it wishes. Thus spoke Zarathustra. So again we have Nietzsche saying here the idea of being reclusive is much better and fleeing and escaping. In this case from towns, why is that the case? Because towns are full of people who are lustful and therefore want to give in to their sexual drives and sexual desires. Then immediately we have the counter to that. What's a way to get control of your sexual desire? What is a way that's going to be argued to be healthier for us and what's argued to be better for us is chastity and therefore abstaining completely from all sex but the problem with that of course is when you abstain then it doesn't solve the problem of that drive that's there and it's the same as a drive for hunger when we need to eat every single day and you abstain from that then you're going to get hungry and of course you need to eat it's the same thing here that's argued for if you abstain then your sexual drive is going to rear its head and it's going to need to be satisfied and it's the more that we abstain and the more that we don't indulge it's the more that what's held up to be good for us chastity is said to be a vice because the more and more it causes suffering and harm for us not only in the sense of wanting to give in to your sexual desires but also just in a mental health state and also the problems following on from that as well of just viewing your natural drives within the body in a very negative sense and the harmful effect that that could have upon our mental health but on the other hand as well it is a kind of double-edged sword in a way that on the other hand if you completely indulge in it altogether and become promiscuous then you can cause suffering for yourself as well and ultimately just become completely unhappy and completely miserable and completely unfulfilled as well and a great sort of character of that as well as charlie sheen's character in two and a half men the tv show where he just has this stream of complete promiscuity all the time and from all that he just leads quite a nice lifestyle as well because he's a jingle writer for um television advertisements but ultimately his um own personal life eventually hits a block as well in which he then wants to have a personal relationship and not just have a set of promiscuous relationships because of being completely unfulfilled so really for Nietzsche striking that balance as well of like hunger as well satisfying it and feeling good about ourselves and also being wary about what's held up as something that's good for us like complete abstinence because actually in the long run that could do more harm for us especially in the sense of a mental health problems as well that it'll entail with and all that and a great movie example here to fit in with the section is the movie cruel intentions from 1999 which is a wee teen romance film and this is a description as well for the plot from wikipedia in an upscale new york city mansion wealthy and popular teenager catherine Mertiel discusses her prep school with mrs cadwell and her daughter cecil catherine promises mrs cadwell that she will look out for the naive cecil when catherine's stepbrother sebastian valmont enters the room mrs cadwell reacts to him coldly and leaves with cecil Catherine tells Sebastian that she intends to use Cecil to take revenge on ex-lover Court Reynolds, who dumped her for Cecil. Catherine asks Sebastian to seduce Cecil, thereby spoiling her in Court's eyes. Sebastian refuses because he's planning to seduce Anne Hargrove, the headmaster's virgin daughter, who published an essay in support 
of chastity until marriage. After some negotiation, they agree on a wager. If Sebastian fails to seduce Annette, Catherine gets Sebastian's vintage Jaguar XK140. If he succeeds, Catherine will have sex with him, as Catherine is the only girl Sebastian has failed to bed. And so we have that nice set up as well for the film Cruel Intentions about wanting to seduce someone who is held to be chaste and will remain so until married. And of course you have the devious nature there of a person coming in with their own plans there as well. How dare this guy seduce this woman in order to get to bed another woman who he's failed to bed so far. So continuing on, Sebastian begins to fall in love with Annette, who returns his feelings but is still hesitant. Sebastian calls her a hypocrite because although she claims to be waiting for her one true love, she resists him when she chooses to love her back. Annette finally relents, but Sebastian, confused about his own feelings, now refuses her. Annette flees to the estate of her friend's parents, and Sebastian finds her and professes his love, and they consummate their relationship. Catherine offers herself to Sebastian after he wins the bet, but he rejects her, and now he only wants Annette. Enraged and jealous, Catherine insults his masculinity. Stung, Sebastian informs her that he was planning to tell Annette the truth. Catherine warns him that doing so will destroy both his and Annette's reputations. Sebastian lies to Annette, claiming he was just wanting to see what she was like in bed, but he has no real feelings for her. Devastated, Annette tells him to leave. Sebastian informs Catherine that he's broken with Annette and now wants his reward for winning the bet. Catherine reveals that he, and not Annette, was the true victim of her scheme. For her own amusement, she manipulated him into abandoning Annette once she realised that he truly loved her. She then dismisses him, telling him that she doesn't sleep with losers. So we have this sort of classic, sort of femme fatale image here of a woman who's manipulating a guy to get basically what she wants and of course the manipulation is in very sexual means as well if you do what I say then you can basically have your wicked way with me and it's always that empowerment that she has from the use of sex there as well in order to manipulate the character of Sebastian in the film to do what she wants And then also from the other side of things, from the Annette side of things, we could see as well the whole, once you actually fall in love with someone, is it a bad thing that you want to have sex with them, of course? No, it's not. Why is that? Because you love them and you want to have like the physical manifestation or physical expression of your love. And that's a completely healthy, natural thing to do. And of course, she's still empowered as a character as well, because she just literally throws him aside once she learns of his intentions of what he's doing in the first place and therefore we see sort of two very strong female sort of empowerment styles of characters there and then of course we see the male who's traditionally got a very strong powerful role as well being completely diminished as a character and overpowered completely in a role by two very strong female characters. Thank you very much for listening to the episode. Feel free to drop me a wee email at my address, dissectingphilosophy at gmail.com. I can be also found on Twitter at I am a rubber man. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll hope you join us next time. Mm-hmm.